Back to a time in the 18 and 1900s when ferry boats, hooting and tooting their way around river freight traffic, took as long as 10 minutes to get folks from one country to another, weather permitting. Back to a time when Fred Martin, a Salvation Army captain in Windsor, dreamed of building a great underwater tunnel to connect the bustling downtown areas of Detroit and Windsor. Mr. Martin lived to see his dream come true. Thanks to his determination and $26 million worth of private bank financing, tunnel construction began in June of 1928 when the dredge Gladiator raised the first bucket of mud from the Detroit River at the point where the tunnel would eventually lie. Three separate tunneling methods were used to construct different sections of the tunnel. The open cut method, the trench and tube method, and the shield driven method. All three were begun almost simultaneously, and the completion of each required careful scheduling so that all the sections could be united at about the same time. For the land approaches at either end of the tunnel, the open cut method was used. Workers simply cut a trench to a maximum depth of 53 feet and erected a box-type structure of steel and concrete, which subsequently was covered over with earth. The Canadian entrance was built in a straight line, which sloped gradually to the harbor line. The American entrance had to be built in a gradually descending spiral pattern because there was not enough undeveloped land available in Detroit for a straight line entrance. The middle or underwater section of the tunnel was the most spectacular of all the tunnel operations. It was constructed by the trench and tube method. The operation entailed the construction of nine gigantic tubes built of steel on dry land outside of Windsor. Canal-like trenches were dredged out along the shore into which the tubes would eventually be launched from wooden launchways. In October 1928, the steel for the first of the tube sections was put into place. The steel plates, three-eighths of an inch thick, were stiffened with octagonal steel collars inside and out. All the plates were welded, riveted, and tested to ensure that each section was watertight. Extensive use of electrical welding, then a relatively new technology, enhanced the reliability of watertight seals. The ends of the tubes had to be sealed prior to launching into the canal. Special 10 by 10 watertight timber bulkheads were built for this purpose. The bulkheads were backed up by steel trusses and covered by inch thick sheeting for water tightness. Eight separate layers of waterproofing were applied. Finally, to form the base of the tube, concrete was poured into wooden forms which were constructed along the bottom of the tube. This also served as a keel to help stabilize the tube when afloat. When completed, the tube section measured 31 feet across and 248 feet long. Tube A was launched first. The launching was a dismal failure. The canal had not been dredged deep enough for the tube to float. Workers looked on helplessly as the tube became immediately mired in the mud. To overcome this temporary setback, hollow wood pontoons had to be constructed, and the area to the side of the tube was dredged deeper. Once the pontoons were filled with water, they were sunk, then attached to the tube. Then the pontoons were pumped out, and as expected, the extra buoyancy from the pontoons helped float the tube. After launching, the tube was towed to a deeper slip where more wooden forms were constructed around the sides and top of the tube. Concrete for the interior walls and roadway was also poured at this stage. 
The concrete was poured over reinforcing rods and steel forms which held it in position until it hardened. When completely concreted, the circumference of each steel tube eventually was surrounded by a wall of interior and exterior concrete 36 inches to 42 inches thick. During the winter, construction continued on the remaining eight tubes. All eight were launched successfully and towed into the deeper slips for concreting. While the tubes were being readied, six miles upstream, dredging barges began the process of digging through the stiff gray clay at the bottom of the Detroit River. They were preparing a trench into which the underwater tube sections would eventually be sunk. When completed, the trench at its greatest depth was 85 feet below the surface of the water, 20 feet across at the bottom, and 90 feet across at the top. Just prior to sinking the tubes, a sand bed was prepared in the bottom of the trench to correct the grade. For this process, a special leveling device was designed. It consisted of a hollow rectangular raft of steel pontoons. Rails were placed on top of the pontoons and a special carriage traveled back and forth over them, acting as a sweeper for the sand bed. The successful sinking of the tubes was largely due to the development of this ingenious device, which ensured that the sand bed was placed with great accuracy. It took four tugs about three hours to tow each tube upstream for final concreting and sinking. The balance of the outside layer of concrete was applied at an anchorage point about 300 feet above where the trench was being prepared. At that point, each completely concreted tube weighed 8,000 tons and was submerged about a foot below the surface of the water. Before the tube was sunk, tall masts were fastened to each end to serve as guides for the engineers to align the tube into position. A buoyancy scow was positioned over the submerged tube and cables were connected to the tube ends. Blocks of concrete were applied to the ends of the tube to sink it into the waiting trench. One of the most difficult procedures during the construction of the tunnel was the sinking of the last tube section. Since the tube was almost as deep as the river itself, it dammed up a considerable amount of water. Four 25-ton anchors were placed in the bottom of the river, and three powerful tugs were positioned to pull against the anchors, hauling the tube back if it drifted too far downstream. As each consecutive tube was sunk, divers fastened them together with huge steel lug pins. When all of the tubes were locked together, divers placed steel forms around the joints and poured a collar of tremi concrete. The tubes were then covered over with between 5 and 20 feet of backfill clay. Meanwhile, the third type of tunneling process, known as the shield-driven section, was slowly inching its way toward the underwater tube section already in place. 
The shield-driven sections began in a shaft near the end of the excavated land approaches and extended 30 feet beyond the harbor line. The shield used for boring through the earth was the largest in North America at the time, 32 feet in diameter and over 15 feet long. The progress of the shield as it inched its way through the earth resembled a giant mole. A gang of workmen, known as muckers or sand hogs, dug ahead of the shield, slicing away the clay with manually operated knives, then passing it back through the shield to others who moved it on little hopper cars to the surface. As soon as the muckers excavated a few feet in front of the equipment, the shield was forced ahead. Hydraulic jacks pushed the shield ahead two and a half feet at a time. This was known as the shove. A series of airlocks maintained high air pressure inside the steel ring structure. The high pressure kept out the water. As the shield advanced forward, workmen poured the concrete for the interior walls and the roadway. Eventually, the big day arrived when the shield-driven sections made contact with the buried tunnel tubes. Incredibly, there was less than one inch of error. The bulkheads were torn down and the finishing work began. The roadway was paved with two million granite blocks and the walls were tiled with over 200,000 enameled porcelain tiles. In addition to the tunnel itself, about 25 buildings were constructed at either end. Facilities for customs and immigration inspection areas were provided. Toll booths were built. And among the original buildings still standing are two large ventilation towers which house huge fans that continuously blow fresh air into the tunnel and extract stale air and exhaust fumes. These fans are capable of completely changing the air in the tunnel every 90 seconds. On November 1st, 1930, crowds gathered on both sides of the river to officially dedicate the new tunnel. The mayors of Windsor and Detroit made speeches, and President Herbert Hoover pressed a button from the White House, sounding gongs and signaling the start of a fireworks display. The crowds joined in choruses of two nations as Detroit and Windsor radio stations broadcast news of the tunnel's completion to hundreds of people across North America. 